Good evening. Good evening. If you're in the sanctuary and you're willing and able to stand, please do. If you're at home, set aside everything you're working on and participate in service with us tonight. Why don't you let us know if you're at home what you had for dinner? Type that into the comments on your screen if you're able to do that. Because I haven't eaten dinner yet, so you're, I, I just want to know what, what I could look forward to after service. So maybe you'll give me a good idea. Kate, what did you have for dinner? Nothing yet. She hasn't eaten dinner either. Anybody have here? Have, Joan, what did you have for dinner? Stir fry. Stir fry. James? Pizza. Pizza? All right. Brent, did you have dinner yet? No? no? All you people are like me. Don't eat till late. All right. Let's pray. Amen? Lord God, we just thank you that we can come together as believers in the church, participate online. Lord, we thank you uh, that, that uh, we come in unity under under you, Lord, and it's about you tonight. Lord, we thank you for the joy that you give us and that your joy is our strength. Lord, our strength doesn't come, uh, our, our spiritual strength doesn't come from the natural things of this world, but Lord, our, our strength comes from your, our, our joy comes from your strength, I'm sorry. The joy of the Lord is our strength. We'll get there. So God, we love you, we thank you, we just worship you tonight, and I'm gonna stop talking because I'm stammering over my lips. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. God bless all of you. Though the tears may fall, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. Though my heart may fail, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. While there's breath in my lungs, I will praise you, Lord. In the dead of night, I'll When the waters rise, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. While there's hope in this heart, I will praise you, Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness I'll dance, in the shadows I'll sing.
strength. We praise you, Lord. We thank you for strengthening us and giving us joy, the joy that no one can take from us. We praise you, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, for your love, your great love. took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Let's sing that again. Before I spoke a word,
shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. after me.
raise our hallelujah tonight, Lord. We thank you that even if we're in the middle of a storm, Lord, we can sing your name louder and louder. And Lord, up from the ashes, hope will arise. Lord, we know that death is defeated by Christ uh, giving his life for us, and hope is alive. The King is alive. So God, we thank you for the resurrection and the death of Jesus Christ. We thank you that he rose again so that we can have life. Lord, we thank you that his blood was shed for us. So when you look upon us, you see the righteousness of Christ, not our sins, not our shortfalls, but you see Jesus. And so God, tonight we just raise that hallelujah to you. We glorify you. We magnify you. We lift you up. Lord, help us tonight to, to um, hear your word, apply it to our hearts, live it out in our lives. Lord, bless each one that's here in the sanctuary. Bless each one that's participating online. Lord God, we love you. We thank you. And in Jesus' name, Everyone said, Amen. Amen. All right, good evening. Bonnie Jill, hi. 
Good to see you tonight. I forget where you are in the country. You'll have to remind me. She's not from Eau Claire. And Bonnie, the other Bonnie, and Annie is here with us tonight. Vicki, thank you for joining us tonight. Dennis, thank you for joining us, and the Dennis that's here as well. Uh, Mrs. Adder is online tonight. Bonnie, remind Colorado Springs. I knew that because we're talking about coming to see you eventually. Thank you for joining us from Colorado Springs tonight. That's kind of a cool place to be right now, I would imagine. All right. So if you didn't uh, tell us what you had for dinner and you're online, tell us what you had for dinner. I don't see anything. So that means I don't get dinner tonight. I asked you all at the beginning of service what you had for dinner, so I knew what I could think about eating later, and nobody told me what they were having for dinner except for Joan and James. So it's either stir fry or pizza right now. Mac and cheese. How about you guys? What did you have for dinner? Chili. That sounds good. You guys? Rice and beans sounds good. Bonnie had egg rolls. That sounds really good, too. Wow. All right, opening up my options. You guys haven't had dinner yet, because I think we're doing dinner, aren't we? OK. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, so for those of you who are joining us tonight, maybe on the uh, first time, Jill, uh, Bonnie had a protein bar at her desk. <laughs> well, you still have time. Um, on a Wednesday night, uh, we typically are going through a book uh, in scripture and kind of going through verse by verse, and so we're in the book of Hosea for our second week. Um, and Hosea is a deep book, isn't it? It's a short book. It's one of the minor, proper, minor prophets, but it is a deep book. And so tonight we're going to look at chapter 2. I was going to read the whole chapter to start with, but we're going to read it throughout the message, so I'm not going to read the whole chapter to start with. I just wanted to give Alex some extra work to do to put all that into pro presenter as if I was going to read it all. <laughs> Poor Alex. But you know, the Bible has an eternal message, doesn't it? It has an eternal message. It begins with marriage. After God said in the beginning, he created the heavens and the earth, it begins with the marriage. And the first two chapters of scripture open up uh, with God bringing an Adam, and Adam and Eve together in marriage. And if you go all the way to the end of scripture in Revelation, the last two chapters end with God's people described as a city, a new Jerusalem, or a, 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 I'll get there, adorned as a bride for her husband, right? Jesus. And so you think about, we got one bookend in the front of the Bible where, where uh, we hear marriage, and we have a book at the end of the Bible where we hear marriage. And you look through all of Scripture, and it's really the story of God's relationship with his people, and it's a romance story, almost. So God is striving to have a relationship with his body throughout all of Scripture. One pastor said the story of the Bible is God saying, I loved you, and I lost you, and I want you back. And we know as we've been studying Israel throughout our time together over the, over the years throughout the Old Testament that Israel kind of always comes to God, and they fall away from God. And they come to God, and they fall away from God. And so we, we see that, and we'll see that tonight as we look at Hosea chapter 2. And so the story of the Bible is a story of God pursuing that wayward bride and uh, drawing and urging her to come back and making her ethically beautiful again and eternally happy. And, and the gospel is the message of Christ giving his life for his people, right? That's the message of the gospel. Jesus gave his life for us. As a husband sacrifices for his wife, right? Husbands, you're supposed to sacrifice for your wife. Don't know if you knew that or not. And, you know, marriage is not just a human uh, institution for our enjoyment. And marriage is not just a human institution for our flourishing. It tells us something about the very purpose of why we were created and why we exist. It tells us about who we are. Human marriages exist as a dim reflection of the eternal marriage that Christ will have with the church. Amen? And so the book, book of Hosea kind of drops us in the middle of the story of, of Adam and Eve getting married. And in the end times, the church, uh, Jesus coming back for his bride. And, and Hosea kind of drops us in the middle of this theme. And remember, as we talked last week, those of you who are here or participating online, the pattern in Hosea is sin and judgment and grace. Remember that? Sin, judgment, and God's grace. And it's a repeated cycle that we're going to see throughout the book of Hosea. 
and as we followed that last week in the first chapter. And the same pattern is in chapter 2. And, and we see the nature of Israel's wrongdoing and the justice of God's judgment, and then we see the surprise entrance of God's grace. And this pattern exists to magnify the love of God. That's why that pattern is there. And so we'll follow that pattern again this evening. And so as we walk through the pattern of sin, and we walk through the pattern of judgment, and we walk through the pattern of salvation, Hosea chapter 2 redefines each of these categories for us, maybe differently than we've seen before. And it adds a layer to each of those categories that we may not have had before or that we typically don't operate with. And so this text takes our basic categories of sin, judgment, and grace and makes us look at them tonight in a different angle. And, and this new angle maybe for you tonight on each one of them can be life transforming for you. Your, a light bulb may turn on and that's exactly the point. And so Hosea takes our categories and he puts them in a new perspective maybe that we're not used to seeing. And he gives us a new perspective on sin and he gives us a new perspective on judgment and a new perspective on salvation. And so I want to walk through those together. So first we're going to look at a new perspective on sin. And the first part of the chapter identifies the nature of Israel's problem. And so I want to break that down a little bit. First of all, it tells us that sin is spiritual adultery or sin as spiritual adultery. And so look at Hosea with me, chapter 2, verse 2 where uh, he says, bring charges against your mother, bring charges for she is not my wife, nor am I her husband. Let her put away her harlotries from her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts. Now remember when we look at Hosea, Hosea is looking at Israel as his bride and Israel is cheating on him, right? I want to read this in the English Standard Version, uh, chapter 2, verse 2. Plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife and I am not her husband. And she put away her whoring from her face and her adultery between her breasts. So the first chapter, remember, of Hosea introduced Israel as a mother with children. And we looked at some of the names last week of those children. And this mother is the nation as a whole and the children of the people within the nation, right? And God is speaking to the people of Israel to plead with one another as a nation here. And the problem with the nation is that she's been engaged in and in the, as this verse puts it, harlotry, right? Or adultery. And what does it mean for people to commit adultery? So those of us who are married know what adultery is, right? You're sexually unfaithful with your spouse. And, and, and that's true to some extent, I believe, of Israel at this time. Um, that they've probably had some sexual un unfaithfulness going on among the people. But that's not primarily what's happening and what's in view of what God is talking about here. It's not referring directly to their unfaithfulness in their marriages. It's referring to something deeper and broader than that. God is saying that they're committing adultery not against one another, like we would typically, typically look at adultery, and that may be true, but he's talking about them committing adultery with him, committing adultery against him. He is the husband, and Israel is the wife, and she's sleeping around, right? She's committing spiritual adultery. And so most people think of sin, if I would say define sin, you would say, well, it's breaking God's rules. I did something against what God told me to do. And that, that's true. That's partially what sin is. But, and God does give us commands, and we fail to obey him at times, and that would be considered sin. But here, sin is being redefined not just as breaking God's rules, but breaking God's heart. Think about that. Not just as breaking a rule saying, okay, the, the, one of the Ten Commandments is thou shall not kill, so if I don't kill, I'm not sinning, right? But here God is redefining sin as breaking his heart, right? Think about that for a moment. And, and it, so it's not just breaking God's rules, but breaking God's heart. It's not just disobeying God, it's betraying God. And we'll look at what that means for Israel tonight. And so Hosea is redefining sin as spiritual adultery, and that may be a new perspective for us, for some of you tonight, when you think about sin. You think about me breaking a commandment that God has given me as sin, but here God is defining it as breaking his heart. And next we'll see um, pursuing others' loves, or, I'm sorry, other lovers for provision. And this is what Israel did. In verse 5 of chapter 2, it shows us what this looks like. It says, For their mother has played the harlot, she who conceived them has betrayed, behaved shamefully. 
For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my linen, my oil and my drink. And these are both needs and comfort. So think about, she's, she's addressing things like bread and water. We need bread and water, right? How many need bread and water? Food. We all need food. Or we need clothing, my wool and my linen. And so uh, these, are, these are specifically speaking of needs, and they clarify needs, basic sustenance. And also I think um, the oil and drink is probably referring to, to more than necessities. They're, they're luxuries at this time. Right? And drink meaning not water, but probably wine at this time. They're comforts. And so it's a summary of what Israel needed and wanted. I need food, I need clothes, and I need pleasure. That's what they needed and wanted. And these are the blessings that God gives us all the time. Right? We may go do a job and earn a paycheck, go to the store, buy food, cook it, and put it on the table. I got food on the mind tonight, don't I? But really, God's the only one that ultimately provided that food. You know, a lot of us say, well, I, I earned the food, money to get the food. It's me that paid for the food. But God had to provide it for us in the first place or provide the skills that we use to work for that food. So this is a summary of what Israel needed and what they wanted in life. And these are the blessings, again, that God gives us. But what Israel was doing is she was seeking her needs and her wants from somewhere else other than God. She was seeking her needs and wants from somewhere else other than God. She was looking for something other than God to be the one that met her needs. We're all guilty of that, aren't we? And, and a place she looks here, it, it, he refers them to as her lovers. So Israel has turned from depending on God for her needs, and she's receiving God, or I'm sorry, she was receiving from God. She's not receiving from God blessings, but she's going to other places for her needs. And we'll look at the effect of that in a little bit. And so she's turned to the other places for those things. Then Hosea shows us that spiritual adultery is really idolatry. Spiritual adult adultery is really idolatry. So who are these lovers? And so let's look at chapter 2, verse 8 and verse 13. Uh, it says that they're idols. For she did not know that I, God says, I gave her grain, I gave her new wine, and I gave her oil, and I multiplied her gold and silver, which they then prepared for Baal. And we know that Baal is a false god or an idol, right? I will punish her for the days of the Baals, to which she burned incense. She decked herself with earrings and jewelry, and went after her lovers, but for she forgot me, she, but me she forgot, says the Lord. So Hosea is referring to the Baals, right? The false gods. Baal was a prominent idol at that time in the land of Canaan before even Israel entered the land. The people of Canaan worshipped Baal. And, and they, uh, the people of the land worshipped various gods, including Baal. And the nations around them worshipped fake gods as well. And here's how one author shows how that could have uh, uh, developed for Israel. It began perhaps when, when something as innocuous as placing the image of Baal in a farmer's land. Because that's what every Canaanite neighbor did. They would put Baal, an image of Baal, in their land, and that would increase their crop production. So then the Israelites were like, well, everybody's doing it, so I'm just going to put the idol out in my land because everybody does it and it works, right? And it's what people did in the land and it appeared to be working. And gradually then the invisible God, Yahweh, uh, lost ground to all the Baals. People could see the physical Baal in the, in the, in the, in the farmland. And um, people could handle them, touch them. Who's, uh, and and uh, then their religion was concerned with the necessities of life more than the rigid demands. And it was the Baals that many Israelites started to become to believe that, th that he helped their crops grow. And he blessed them with their children. And they started leaning on those false gods instead of the one true God. And at the heart of idolatry is placing our confidence, our ultimate confidence in anything other than God. Think about that. That's what the heart of idolatry is. It's putting my ultimate confidence in something other than God for my needs and my desires. So Israel needed rain, right, for their crops in order to have the comforts and the luxuries of life. And they began, they began to depend on idols uh, to provide for them. They believed that these other gods would provide what they needed. So Israel committed spiritual adultery, right, in two ways. First, by loving the blessings of creation more than the creator. 
How many of you love the blessings of creation more than you love the creator who created them? Second, by looking at anything other than God to provide those things. I'm going to give you some examples of how that works in our lives. It shows us that that doesn't fit with reality. To love the blessings of creation more than the creator or to, to look to anything other than God for those things does not fit with reality. Hosea, over, or Hosea emphasizes that when we pursue other lovers, which is how he's referring that to here, it doesn't fit with reality. It's wrong, right? That's because the very things that we're receiving from our other lovers, we're, we are actually receiving from God anyway. Because Baal, he can't do anything when he's standing out in the field, but look good. I don't know how he looked, right? Look at Hosea 2.8 again. For she did not know that I, God says, gave her the grain. I gave her the new wine. I gave her the oil. And I multiplied her silver and gold, which they then prepared for Baal. Wow. So spiritual adultery is receiving those gifts from God and giving thanks to something or someone else for those gifts. It fails to acknowledge God as our provider. It's not just leaving God and what he gives to pursue other people and what they can give. It, it's continuing to receive what only God can give because God is the one that makes plants grow, not Baal. But we give credit to Baal, or they were, and, it, and they were attributing the success to the other things. It's like a child ignoring their parent and thanking his stuffed animals for his meals. Thank you, Winnie the Pooh, for cooking me dinner. <laughs> right? He's thanking the gift of the parents. Um, he's thanking the gift of the parents, Winnie the Pooh, for the gifts of the parents, right? Without giving thanks to the parents directly. So what are the implications of this? Th this spiritual dynamic was, it was not limited to Israel, right? It's at work today in every culture, in every society that exists. In, all, in our culture, we may not bow down to a statue like Baal. We may not sacrifice to imaginary gods. But it's not without reason that some women say of their husbands and some husbands say of their wives, they're married to their job. Right? They look at their jobs to give them what they need and what they want. And that may be different for different people. Some use their jobs to provide the sense of approval. Instead of going to God for a sense of approval, we go to work for a sense of approval. Some look at their gods or their jobs for success. Some look at their jobs for status, right? Or things that they long for. Others use it to gain more and more finances, to gain a sense of security, or a sense, or, or for the sake of just funding a life of luxury. And when it provides, the job provides all the su success that's attributed to it, we thank the job and not God. And so we attribute our, things, our success to things like the stock market. And we attribute our, our success to our hard work. It's what I did. And we attribute our sec security to maybe some wise financial planning. Or our job security to our education. I went to school for all those years, that's why I have a job. Or we put our hope and security in an elected leader. But the truth is, is that financial success and security does not come from those places. It does not come from those places. And we forget that everything ultimately comes from God. Everything comes from God. He is the one who provides. He is the one that will provide. And he is the one to be thanked for all things. So here's how you can find your true lover. Answer these questions. I'm going to have Alex put a couple questions on the screen, one at a time. Or he's got them both up. That's fine. Answer this question and you'll find who your true lover is. If I could only have blank fill in the blank then I would be finally then I would finally have a sense of self-worth if I could only have a skinny body then I would finally have a sense of self-worth if I could only have a boyfriend a girlfriend a husband or wife then I would have a sense of self-worth if I could only have enough money to be happy Anything that you're putting into that blank is your lover, your spiritual lover. The second question is, I would have a sense of significance if I could only have. What would that be? Think about that. What is it? Maybe it's obedient children. <laughs> or it could be that uh, you have a family that was all put together and everything works well and your kids are, are good. And maybe you feel like you've made it in your social circle and so now 
you feel a sense of significance. Or maybe if you could only have a bank account with a certain amount of money in it, you would be able to finally rest, right? Or if you could move into a certain size house or a particular kind of neighborhood, uh, then you'd feel like you finally arrived in life. If you're putting things in those blanks that are not God, those are your lovers. You're committing spiritual adultery tonight. Here's the problem. We put our hope in other places that will not satisfy us. They will, they will not ultimately come through for you, right? And that's because we're trading the grace of God for a works-based life. We're trading the grace of God for a works-based life. Look at Hosea 2.12. I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, of which she had said, these are my wages that my lovers have given me. Who gave those to her? Not her lovers. God gave those to her. When she received, when Israel was receiving freely from God as a husband by grace, she's not working for those other lovers, right? But, and, and God blesses with us with all things freely, but we forget him. And we look out and we see all the things we need and we see all the things that we want and we become uncertain that we have them all or we, we, we think we have to have them. And so we do what we think we needs to be done to get them. I got to work harder. I got I to gotta try harder, right? God isn't a factor. And so we rely on the only things we can see. And that's our hard work. And that's our determination or a job or education or a savings account. And we work and we work and we work to try to be successful in life. And as we go through life with that mentality, we're going to get wore out. Because we're never really secure. Because you know what? The dollar value changes. And the food prices go up. And things start to fall apart. Right? We're never going to be secure. What happens if we put all our hope in our job and we lose our job? What happens when you put all your hope in a person and for whatever reason that person is no longer there? It won't hold out for you. What happens when we put our identity and our self-worth in a position and we lose that position? You're devastated. There's nothing to fall back on. Then we'll often turn on ourselves and we'll hate ourselves because we have nothing to fall back on. Because in a sense, we think that's my fault. I messed up. Or we didn't work hard enough. Or we, couldn't, we could have done it better, maybe. So God is saying you'll always cling to something or someone as your husband, right? It's your spiritual husband. You'll always treat something or someone as your provider. And you'll always seek to have your needs and wants met. He said, but if you leave me, you're leaving me for a life of anxiety. You're leaving me for a life of uncertainty. And guess what? You're going to be empty. Because none of those things will fulfill like I can fulfill. Because if you build your life around anything other than me, he says it's not going to work. He says it's not going to last. Only he can provide for us. And so the main emphasis here is not just saying that it's not satisfying. It's saying that it's offensive to God. He's not saying that you won't just be unsatisfied. He's saying you're offending me. You're being unfaithful to me. It shows that sin is not just breaking the rules, but it's breaking God's heart. It's putting something in your trust in something other than God. It's more than missing an abstract mark, per se. It's betraying God. It's treachery. It's unfaithfulness. So how does this help us understand ourselves? It, again, it shows us more than sin being breaking the rules, or that it's breaking the rules. It's breaking God's heart. i got to move quickly or I'm not going to get done. Uh, secondly, that's a, that's a new perspective on sin for some of you. Some of you think that sin is just breaking rules, but it's also breaking God's heart. Let's look at a new perspective on judgment. Let's look at what happens. God responds in Hosea chapter 2, verses 6 through 13, with nine statements. We're not going to go through all nine. And they begin with, I will. This is God saying, I will. So God is now acting, and he's acting in judgment. And Hosea gives us a new perspective on judgment. It's a different kind of judgment than we would expect. We read in verses 6 through 8 of chapter 2, Therefore, behold, I will hedge up your way with thorns, and I will wall her in so she cannot find her paths. Why is he blocking her in? She will chase her lovers, but not overtake them. Yes, she will seek them, but not find them. He's going to prevent Israel from seeking her lovers, and he tells us why. 
Then she will say, I will go and return to my first husband. Israel's going to stop following the false the false providers, and go back to her first provider, which was God. For then it was better for me than now, for she did not know that I gave her grain, new wine, and oil, and I multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. He's going to wake her up, Israel up, to a reality. He's going to take away her blessings so that she'll wake up and turn back to him, right? We've all experienced that in life. He'll remove her blessings so that she'll remember that he is the one that takes care of her. And how he, will he do that? Verse 9. Therefore I'll return and take away my grain in its time and my new wine in its season and I will take back my wool and my linen. And again, those are marks of that time of, of economic security. That's how they knew they were secure. These are the things that Israel's seeking. The, the grain, the wine, the wool, the linen. And, and she's asking, she's seeking them from idols right now at this point. But God was the one who gave them to her all along. And so he's going to stop blessing her with these things. And he's going to stop providing for her needs and her desires. And she's going to seek those things from the idols. And guess what? They can't provide them. They're not going to be able to provide them because God stopped the blessing. They didn't come from the idols at all at any time. They always came from God. And so here's what's happening. Let me give you an illustration. A wealthy man owns a large plot of land. And he has a large mansion on that plot of land. And he hires several men to manage his estate and his finances. And he's married and he lavishes his wife with blessings because he's doing well. So he just buys her stuff to make her happy and to love her, to care for her. And he's taking care of every need that his wife has. And he, he gives her everything that she wants. And over time, she starts to spend time with these other men who are taking care of his land and taking care of his, his, his estate and managing his finances. And they promise her things. And they promise to give her things, whatever she wants, as long as she sleeps with them. I'm going to get a little bit graphic. And so she does. And they give her whatever she wants. And they're using the money from her husband's account anyway. They're not buying her the stuff she wants with their money. They're using their master's money, right? And so she thanks them for all the gifts that they're buying her. Thank you for buying me all this stuff. And she becomes dependent on these men for all, all the things that she has, but it's not their money anyway, it's her husband's money that's buying the stuff. And she forgets this. And so there's two things here. She wanted the husband's gifts more than the husband, right? Just like we want the things of creation more than the creator. And she kept enjoying the husband's gifts, but she forgot where they were coming from. She assumed they were coming from the servants, but really it was the husband's money that was paying for the gifts. So in restorative judgment, the husband cuts off the finances available to these men. And so he cuts the cable bill, he cuts the credit cards, he cuts the department store cards, whatever you want to call it. And the wife now can't get anything from these men. The only way she's going to get her needs met is to go where? Back to her husband, right? And so then she returns to her husband in desperation and he blesses her directly. Yep, you want it? Here it is. I'll give it to you. And she sees that, and she sees it was all from him all along, and now she's back with him. And so here's what this does, and when we think about, that's what happened with Israel here. It really is, uh, de redefines aspects of God's judgment in our lives, and it redefines some aspects of hardship. And, and here's some questions. What happens when things fall apart in your life? What happens when things fall apart in our life? Or what happens when things that are most important are taken away from us? Where do we usually, where do we go? What happens when things that, that we're putting our hope in are threatened? Right? What's going on? Could it be that the Lord is trying to wake us up? Could it be that he's showing us that we've been relying on these very things as our functional gods? Could it be that we're, worship, we're forgetting God as our husband and we're looking to our job? or we're looking to our parental abilities, or we're looking to our bank account, or Joan is looking to her beautiful attractiveness, or we're looking to our health, or we're looking to our ability to provide what we most desperately desire. And when the job is lost and the finances crumble and the health is threatened and the children disobey publicly, could it be that this is God saying, wake up, wake up, just like he did for Israel. 
He removed his blessings so that they would re realize that they, weren't, they were coming from him in the first place. Has God taken things out of our lives to wake us up to help us recognize, man, that was coming from God in the first place? Why did I leave my first love? Why did I start worshiping my job? Why did I start worshiping my spouse? Why did I start worshiping my bank account? It was all coming from God in the first place. Hosea is showing us that sometimes the removal of God's blessings can be the greatest of God's blessings. Think about that. Sometimes the removal of God's blessings can be the greatest of God's blessings because it really wakes us up to our spiritual adultery. It tells us, wait a minute, I'm looking to the wrong source for these things. It is our divine husband, God, acting in love and mercy to bring us back to himself. Finally, a new perspective on salvation. So that was a new perspective on sin, a new perspective on judgment. Let's look at a new perspective on salvation. In verses 14 through 23 of chapter 2, so it's bringing us through these movements in this pattern that we talked about. Sin, judgment, grace. Sin, judgment, salvation. So we move from sin and judgment and we move to salvation. And so for Hosea, grace often comes as a surprise. And as we go through the book of Hosea, you're going to see that, that grace comes as a surprise. Every, every line in the rest of the chapter, of chapter 2, is full of grace and it's full of love. And it's beautiful. And that's not something we should expect. Bear with me. The first two words show us uh, this the first word is therefore therefore is a strange transition so we just read about God's judgment he's taking away from Israel what he already provided for Israel and and God says she just went after her lovers and she forgot about me what would we expect therefore I will divorce her that's what we naturally would expect okay fine you want to go somewhere else go right but only grace and mercy come hence the second word behold or look and this is a surprise entrance of grace. And so we see three kinds of promises here. First, we see the promise of alluring love. And in verse 14, this is what it says. Therefore, behold, or therefore, look, I will allure her. This is God saying, I will bring Israel back to me. I will bring her into the wilderness and speak comforts to her. So when a divorce really should come because she's committing adultery, instead, God says, I will allure her back. I'll lure her back into my heart. And, and, and how will he allure her? He will speak comfort to her, he says. Speak comfort to her in the, in the Hebrew is literally, literally saying, I will speak to her heart. I will speak to her heart. It's a figure of speech. You know, God is not interested in speaking words to our wills to get our actions to change. And he's not interested in speaking to our heads to get our thoughts to change. He's not interested in speaking to our, our emotions to manipulate our behavior. God is interested in speaking to our heart because that's the deepest part of us. That's the core of who we are. And God always speaks to our heart, doesn't he? Yes, it resonates to our mind and it resonates to our emotions and it resonates uh, to our will, but he speaks to our heart. Charles Spurgeon said that that's what preaching is. He said the object of true preaching is to the heart. We aim at divorcing the heart from sin and wedding it to Christ. And he says that's what every sermon should do to us. Every time we read the Bible, every time we console each other with God's word, God is seeking to speak to our heart so that we become divorced to sin and wed to Christ. Isn't that beautiful? And what does he say? I love how uh, uh, Jeremiah Burroughs says it. He was a Puritan of the 1600s and he wrote a, a big commentary in the book of Hosea. I've never read so much in Hosea. And he came to this part of the, the chapter and he says, here's what God will say. I will unfold the beauty and excellency of the... Uh, I lost my spot. I will unfold the beauty and excellency of the infinite, infiniteness of my goodness and loving kindness. And set an array before her souls the exceeding glory of riches of my grace. Yep, I'll take that. God himself says he will take the role of a man pursuing a bride. Think about that. He will become artful in the way he shows his love to that bride. He will strategize to win our hearts, and it will work. Amen? Then we read in verse 15, I will give her vineyards from there, and the valley of Achor as a door of hope. She shall, she shall, she shall, she shall seashores on the... <laughs> she shall sing there. 
And in the days of her youth, as, sorry, as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came up from the land of Egypt. He's saying, I will bring my people back just like I did when I brought them out of Egypt, and they will respond. This is a little glimpse into what theologians have come to refer to as irresistible grace. Irresistible grace. I love that phrase because God speaks grace to people. Uh, if he speaks grace to people's minds, we can resist it. But when he speaks it to our heart, we can't resist it. When he speaks his grace to the heart, it shows us his love like this and it makes us it irresistible for, for those whom he wants it, uh, wants it to be, for, for whom he wants it to be. Sex, so that's the promise of the enduring, uh, alluring love. Second is the perspective on, uh, I'm sorry, the promise of eternal marriage. So this, this promise of alluring love, God trying to draw Israel back, God trying to draw us back, leads to the promise of an eternal marriage. Verse 16, and it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that, I will, that you will call me my husband and no longer call me my master. I don't like that translation. So let's look at the English translation because this sounds better. And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband, and no longer you will call me my Baal. So when you look at that word master in the New King James Version, it's not talking like a master of a house. It's talking about an idol, right, that we've put in a master's place in our lives. And so God will turn them away from pursuing their lovers. He will turn them away from that spiritual adultery. She'll no longer have divided loyalties. Israel won't. Israel will no longer, she'll truly repent. She'll have a truly repentant heart and she'll turn back to God and it'll be like a marriage because it is a marriage, right? And then we see in verses 19 and 20, I will betroth, betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy. He says it again. I will betroth you in, in, to me in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. I will betroth is repeated three times. In Hebrew literature, that's how they put things in italics, bold, and underlined. They repeat it three times, right? That's why God's not just holy. He's holy, 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 right? It's an emphasis. It's, it wants us to draw, it's trying to draw our attention to that. And so when God says, I betroth you three times, he wants to wake us up and he wants us to see that. And so God is putting an exclamation point there in that he will betroth them and, and, and he has to convince us that this is true, those who know that they commit spiritual adultery. So first he says, I'll betroth forever. It'll be an eternal marriage, right? His people will never leave him again. There will be mutual faithfulness in that marriage. How can that be? How can God assure that his people will never forsake him again? This assumes the promise of the new covenant that comes with Jesus Christ. At the heart of the new covenant was the promise that God would give his people a new heart. He said, I'll take out their heart of stone and I'll put in a heart of flesh. In other words, he's gonna change people from the inside out. Isn't that what Jesus does to us? He changes us from the inside out. And then we remain faithful to him. I mentioned the phrase irresistible grace. Here's another one, the perseverance of the saints. And so this verse assumes that God will persevere his people to the end. And he'll keep true Christians faithful to him. Right? That's his, he wants us to be faithful and he'll keep us faithful. Because a broken marriage or a marriage can't be broken. The covenant can't be broken. All who come to, to God in that new marriage, in that new covenant, will stay with him in that new marriage. Second, it says he'll betroth in righteousness and justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. So he'll be he'll betrothed in right in faithfulness. You know, when I, whenever I officiate a marriage, I make sure the, the, the couple understands their vows very uh, thoroughly and, and they look at them in advance. So I don't surprise them with vows. I don't say, okay, on the wedding day, we're going to pop some vows out that you're just going to arbitrarily say to each other. I may either make them write them themselves or I give them to them ahead of time and they say, understand these vows. Pray over these vows, far in advance, long before the wedding day. I encourage them to review them in their heart before God's presence because you're about to commit your life to that woman or that man for the rest of your life. So these vows that you're going to say on your wedding day are extremely important. They could not be more serious. And they're so flippantly taken in our culture 
today. In marriage, we promise things like, I'll forsake all others, right, in our human marriages. In marriage, we say things like, I'll hold fast to you until death do us part. Not because, Ted, you got a flat tire and you picked me up late for dinner, so I'm done, right? No, until death do, I, do us part. And, and that's a promise of absolute loyalty and faithfulness. And it's a, it, it's a promise to avoid all unfaithfulness, whether it's through adultery or pornography or straying eyes. I'm talking about our human marriage now. It's a promise of absolute commitment when we make vows to our husband or to our wives. And God makes that promise to us, our spiritual us. And we make that promise back to him. Notice the last line in Hosea 2.20. It says, and you shall know the Lord. It doesn't say you might know the Lord. It doesn't say you could. It says you shall know the Lord. What do you think that means? It's a pretty innocent phrase, but it's a figure of speech again. I want to st bear with me. I know if I get graphic, you'll all get embarrassed. But in the context of marriage, when you know someone, it refers to sexual intercourse, right? In Genesis 4.1, for example, Adam knew his wife Eve. That's how scripture points out that he knew her. And so it's a sexual word. And we have to know, those of you who are married know, that sex is more than physical, right? It's more than a physical union. It's a consummation of a whole life union. It's a physical union. It's a spiritual union. It's an emotional union. It's about knowing and being known, right? And this is applied to our relationship with God, not in a physical way like a husband and wife marriage, but in a very deep, intimate way. And that's the point of salvation. The highest end of salvation is knowing ultimately the, the triune God intimately. Communion with him. Knowing Christ and being known by him. Third and finally, I'm almost done. I'm sorry I'm going a few minutes long. The promise of new creational flourishing. This leads us to the context in which we'll enjoy God forever. Um, our future is not just an isolated individual relationship with God. It's not a disembodied experience in heaven where we sit on a cloud for eternity and play a violin, right? It's a future on a renewed earth and an experience of true human flourishing forever. Look at verse 21. It shall come to pass in that day that I will answer, says the Lord. I will answer the heavens and they shall answer the earth. The earth shall answer with grain. Look at this. Guess what's coming back? With grain, with new wine, and with oil. Those are the very things that Israel was pursuing with her other lovers. The grain, the wine, and the oil. And God, those are the necessities as we talked about and the luxuries in life. And God's going to give them back to her, right? But only when her heart and her life are bound to him in faithfulness. So I want to finish tonight and I want to show you how all this was fulfilled in Christ. Because that's what's important. Not that this isn't important. This, from Hosea's standpoint, is all a future promise. A future promise. He's promising this to Israel as she's entrenched in spiritual adultery. She's in a mess, right? She's worshiping other gods. And she's not turning back. And we know later God's going to send her into judgment and into exile, right? So these promises are out in the future. In Hosea 2.16 it says, And it shall be in that day. In verse 21, and it shall come to pass in that day, in that day, not today, in that day. And that language that the prophets used in that day referred to a great coming, the day of the Lord, right? It's a climax of history when all God's promises would come to fulfillment. The New Testament says that this future end of history day has kind of broken in the middle of history through Jesus, right? He kind of broke in the middle of history, and the promises have begun to be fulfilled in Christ. In John chapter 3, verse 29, John the Baptist says this of Jesus. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. What is he saying? He's saying that the groom has come for his bride. The groom has come for his bride. And, and perhaps it's not a coincidence that when Jesus began his ministry, he did it where? His first miracle was at what? A wedding, wasn't it? And that's why Paul tells us what our earthly marriages are to be like. He says they're to reflect a greater reality of, of the marriage of Christ and the church. Ephesians 25 and 27, I'm sorry, chapter 5, verse 25 and 27 say this. 
Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. That's why marriage exists. That's why marriage exists. And so the day of that presentation is still to come when we get to meet, the church gets to meet Jesus in the end, right? The end of this age wraps up with a wedding feast in the book of Revelation. We will all have a wedding feast when Jesus comes for his bride. So how do we respond? I'm going to give you three responses to this today as I am wrapping up. I'm sorry. I'm almost there. Understand that sin is spiritual adultery. And spiritual adultery is sin. We need to reevaluate everything that we do and how we live our lives in light of that. That means, first of all, that Christianity is not just a religion. It's not merely about keeping rules. It's not merely about learning facts. It's not merely about coming here or participating in services online. It's about a relational faithfulness to God. You get that? Right? What, that means that we look at our lives and all our blessings and we no longer say things like, my children are the ones that give me the sense of approval. <laughs> if you get that, good for you. <laughs> or my status as a wife no longer gives me a sense of worth. Or my success in my career no longer gives me a sense of arrival. Or my bank account no longer gives me a sense of security. We no longer should say my children, my job, my spouse, my work ethic, but we should say my husband or my savior, my Jesus, right? And give thanks to God for everything that he is for us. Think about exclusivity. If you're here tonight or you're participating online and wonder why Christians say things like, Jesus is the only way to salvation, that's why. That's why. Why is there only one way? Why are we not able to be saved in other religions? What are people, what, what about people who are devout and devoted to their gods? Israel was devoted to their gods, weren't they? She was, she was devout in her idolatry. And it was viewed as leaving the one true God in a marriage. There is only one true God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Christianity is a marriage, and there's only to be one husband. I can't worship other gods and still call Jesus my Lord. That's also why Christians believe in the value of faithfulness in our marriages, in our earthly marriages, because we're here to reflect God's faithfulness to us in our eternal marriage. We're to reflect that in our earthly marriages. Amen? Secondly, if God's removal of blessings sometimes can be a blessing, then we need to receive it as a blessing. That's hard for us, right? Sometimes God removes blessings from us to wake us up and say, you know what, you're cheating on me. Come back and I'll bless you again. Identify how God is removing his blessings so that you will not put your hope in the blessings, but you'll put your hope in God himself. Let hardship and suffering drive you closer to God, not further away. And I'll give you the third one as I have you stand, if you would. If the Christian life is about being allured to Jesus, let him allure you. Let him allure you. Let him draw you in. Because that's what it's about, right? It's about having your heart spoken to by Jesus. It's about being one to him. W-O-N. Like he wants to win us to him. Just like you try to win a husband or a wife. It's about being spiritually irresistible, drawn, irresistibly drawn to him. Excuse me, like you're drawn to your husband or wife. Where does he speak to our hearts? Through his word. If you want your heart spoken to by God, open your Bible and read the word of God. That's why we need to be in the Bible daily. That's why we need to be digging into the word of God. Because that's where God speaks to our hearts. We're to hold fast to him. Right? Marriage covenants are about promises and faithfulness. We say forsaking all others and only holding unto you. God says his people will no longer say to his blessings, my Baal or my master, but they'll say my husband. Amen? So a new perspective on sin, a new perspective on judgment, the new perspective on sin, 
is that sin isn't just breaking the rules, it's breaking God's heart. The new perspective on judgment is, is that sometimes God takes things from us to show us he loves us, so we come back to him. And a new perspective on salvation, Jesus is alluring us, attracting us, right? That grace. So God, we just love you. We thank you tonight, Lord, for Hosea. Lord, we thank you for loving us unconditionally. Lord, I thank you that you sent your son to die for us, even though we were spiritually unfaithful to you. Lord, we lived our lives in sin. We still have times in our lives that were sinful. Lord, but you still gave Jesus to die for those sins. And Lord, as we prayed earlier in the night, we thank you that that when Jesus' blood covers us, you see Jesus, you don't see me. You don't see my mistakes. You don't see my shortcomings. You don't see my downfalls. You don't see my insecurities. You don't see my anxiety. You see Jesus. And Lord, I need to look to you as my God, as my king, as my ruler, Lord, and not to the false gods that may be put before me. Not to the gods of this world, not to the gods of my flesh, and not to the gods, uh, the false gods that the enemy may set before me. God, you are my one true provider. You're all of our one true providers. Every good gift comes from the Father above. And God, we thank you that there's only one way to the Father, and that's through Jesus. And God, I thank you that we're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. There's nothing I can do to earn my salvation. Nothing. I can try to live the best possible life I can live, and that's not going to earn my salvation. Lord, but we're saved by grace through faith. Lord, nothing I can do to earn that. So God, I thank you for grace. I thank you that we saw such a beautiful picture of grace tonight in Hosea. You took from Israel what you already were giving them to show her that it was coming from you, and then you gave it back to them. And Lord, you do that in our lives. We may not see it all the time. Lord, but I thank you that you are a just, loving father Who wants to give? And Lord, I always say this, that you're right up in heaven, ready to dump blessings on our head. We just have to orientate ourselves to be on blessing ground. And you're ready to dump blessings on our head. So God, we love you. We thank you. Again, we thank you for what your son has done for us. And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.
thank you, Lord, for saving us. We thank you for loving us so much. We thank you for drawing us to you. We thank you for knowing us and letting us know you. We praise you, Lord. We are forever yours. In Jesus' name. Have a wonderful rest of your week. God bless all of you.